My name is Bronwyn Fox and I'm the Chair of the Victorian Division of ATSI. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. We have a fantastic presentation for you this evening with two speakers. I'm now going to introduce Mark Toner, our fabulous member of our Victorian Division Committee, who will introduce the speakers this evening and I'll speak to you at the end of the event. Thank you, Bronwyn. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our two speakers tonight because it's not often we get a chance to hear from a person who developed a technology um, and then saw it commercialised. And tonight we're hearing from the researcher and the commercialiser. Uh, and I think that's the dream of applied scientists and engineers in particular, to see their technology actually get to market for the benefit of you know, humanity. So our first speaker is Professor Madhu Baskaran of RMIT University. She's a multi-award winning uh, electronics engineer and innovator. Her fundamental research breakthroughs have been recognised with numerous awards, including our own Academy's Batterham Medal in 2018, uh, the APEC Science Prize for Innovation and Research and Education in 2018, and in 2020, the Frederick White Medal awarded by the Academy of Science. I mean, this, this is a fantastic set of really well-deserved awards. Madhu leads the uh, Functional Materials and Microsystems Research Group at RMIT University, which he established in 2010. She's also a node leader and the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Access Director for the ARC Centre of Excellence in the Transformative Meta Opticals Systems, um, CRC, known as TMOS. Her work on electronic skin and wearable sensors has been patented and her group now works collaboratively with multiple industry and design partners to commercialise technology for healthcare and aged care. She is a migrant Australian and a passionate advocate for diversity. She's also co-chair of Women in STEM Australia and is a member of the advisory board for STEM Sisters. So with all those responsibilities, I don't know how Madhu actually does any research, but clearly she does. Professor Madhu Baskaran. Mark and uh, thank you to all of you for coming here in person. This is my first in-person presentation after nearly two years. I'm really excited. Uh, thank you to, again to ATSI for having both of us here tonight to talk about our commercialization journey. So I'll also start by acknowledging the country and uh, again it's the people of the Waiburong and the Moonburong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university as well as a lot of the research which I'll be speaking about today. And we also acknowledge ancestors and elders past and present. I'm almost gonna go back to the start. And by start, I mean, I'm talking about a journey starting from 2012, so nearly 10 year journey now in that aspect. And this was what I looked at when I looked at smart devices. So we're all, I think more than 2012, now uh, we are much more connected. We all have a mobile phone in our pockets. We have uh, tablets, devices. We probably couldn't have survived the pandemic without that. Uh, and But unfortunately, this problem stays pretty much the same. A lot of them are still breakable. A lot of them look like that if you drop them somewhere. And they're not repairable. So as much as you'd love to just go and repair them yourself, more often than not, it's toss them and get a new one. Is, is the way you know you go forward with most of these. So for me, it was more of looking at devices and thinking, how can you make them unbreakable in some sense? Sounded like a dream, sounded like science fiction, but that's pretty much the motivation with which we started this research back in 2012. Can we take electronics as they currently stand? They are beautiful, they are functional, they are versatile, but can you actually remove them from a platform which is silicon based and put them on a platform which is not so silicon based, more like a contact lens type material and thereby render them unbreakable? That's what I thought we wanted, maybe not. Maybe that was my vision, not everyone's vision, but that was pretty much the vision towards, towards which I was working at that point. Can we have something which is unbreakable, flexible, conformal, and therefore you don't really feel yourself wearing it if it's a wearable sensor which is sitting on your body. We talk about wearables all the time. We talk about our watches. We talk about you know other forms of wearable technologies, but they're still a bit clunky and you're still you're having to look out for them. Imagine a world where you can have sensors or you can have wearables on you and you don't have to worry about it so much because you hardly feel yourself wearing them and they're not so breakable anymore. 
as with most engineering issues, uh, it comes with a whole lot of whole sort of challenges. And there are a lot of challenges which probably as a single person you can't really address, which is where a lot of multidisciplinary collaboration comes in. So you work with scientists, you work with other groups of engineers in trying to overcome these challenges. If you Google the word wearable sensors, an image which is on that side is pretty much what comes up every single time. You're imagining a world going forward where you can have sensors attached to every part of your body, sensing either the world around you or sensing what's happening within you. But more often than not, the challenges are pretty much the same. If we want smart devices in the future, which you can truly wear, they need to be on a stretchable or a flexible platform. And what I mean by that is a, a contact lens type material. So just imagine if a wearable is on a contact lens type material, you wouldn't really have those issues of breakability then. Now, typically that substrate ends up becoming a polymery material. So it's a plastic or some kind of a rubber material, which is a substrate. So we're no longer talking about silicon, you're talking about a different kind of a substrate. Most devices have conductive layers. So you're talking metals, which is what makes those electrical connections and conducts electricity and allows you to actually use it as a device. And most devices also have functional layers. Now these could be organic materials or inorganic materials. We are a group who mostly work in organic materials. So for us, it was mainly the oxides. So metal oxides are what we specialize in and they are quite versatile again in terms of using it for various applications. So for, for us, that was what we wanted to focus on and use to create this next platform. So how do you combine these diverse materials? We're literally talking materials as diverse as what you're seeing on the screen over there. Because believe it or not, glass is an oxide. So glass or any other oxide is highly brittle, it's highly breakable. So how do you take that, even if you take it in the form of a thin film or some kind of a coating, it still is not as mechanically pliable or flexible as you'd like it to be compared to the material on the right, which is like your plastic -y polymer -y material. They are very different materials, not just mechanically, but thermally as well. The stability wise, they're very, very different materials. Now, if you do metal oxide depositions, you might use uh, deposition systems and they typically done at temperatures of 300 degrees centigrade, sometimes even up to 600 or 700 degrees centigrade. Try applying anything beyond 120 or 200 degrees centigrade to the material on the right and you'll just have a burnt mess in your hands. So how are you going to combine these very diverse materials and bring them together, very different processing conditions, and but not lose the functionality and still retain all the advantages? That's pretty much the challenge which we set ourselves up with in back in 2012 or 2013. We over, overcame a few challenges. We used a transfer process. I wouldn't go into too much technical details, but feel free to ask me for more details afterwards. What we ended up creating looked like that. Um, in COVID times, this was my image to, to kind of convey to people how transparent, how flexible, and how, how conformal this is. Before COVID, I used to send a sample like this to everybody so they could actually catch it and feel it. Uh, but that's pretty much similar to the sample which the lady is holding in her, in her hands over there. As you can see, thin, transparent, flexible, and it has the oxide layers and the metal layers on, embedded on them to actually act as a sensor. For the engineers in you who are curious to understand how did I manage to make an oxide stretchable, when you actually zoom in and look at the oxide in a microscope, that's how it looks. So it's not a thin film anymore. It's kind of almost like overlapping plates. So even though I actually put it down by thin film deposition technique, the transfer process enables it to look like this. The first time I looked at it, I, I didn't like it, but then I realized that's what actually makes it stretchable. So it's pretty much those overlapping plates sliding on each other which is allowing it to retain its functionality. Looks a bit like the geological plates which make up the Earth's crust. We call it the microtectonic effect. The term didn't take off though, but that's okay. So that was in 2015 or 2016 was when we actually patented the process. And then we were wondering now what? Here we have something and uh, we go th went through the typical journal process where we did this with a material called Indian tin oxide. So ITO, which is your transparent conducting layer Typical journal reviewers said, ah, it works with ITO, but what about other oxides? So we did it with two or three different oxides. It worked with every oxide possible, but then now what? It, it's fantastic, you can do this, but now what? We typically put out media releases around our work. So that allowed me to talk to a lot of people. A lot of people came and spoke to me saying, I saw your media release. I can understand the implications of this technology and can we have a conversation about where it can go? Silly me was excited every time those conversations happened because I thought it's going to lead to industry funding and we're actually going to walk down the path of commercialization. It was three years of those conversations. 
So 2015 or 2018, not just Australian national. So I spoke at international. So I spoke to people in Singapore. I spoke to people in the US, people in Europe. Everyone had an idea for this technology because everyone could see you could use this as a sensor for numerous reasons. But I guess it somehow was sitting in that very early technology readiness levels, but people didn't quite understand where they come into the piece to actually help translate it out. And as far as Australia was concerned, we were a little too early, I guess, to the piece. Because there was startup world was very, very new at that point. And so there weren't many people working in you know, this kind of technology in that space. But I answer every email, I take every meeting. So they were interesting conversations to have. And they kind of fed back into a lot of the fundamental research I continued to do. So even though we didn't really start our commercialization journey then, we still continue to keep using this technology to create various things. So we made some UV sensors. So in the sense you can sense the amount of UV which you're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. You can get a warning that you hit your UV limit for the day, go back in, put on more sunscreen, come back out. So that kind of sensing was what we could easily do with these kind of wearable sensors. We also made most recently a nicotine sensing patch. So that's a bit, that again came out of a conversation with a prospective industry partner. They said, how about if you can sense nicotine? You can do cigarette smoke, but then people are taking up to vaping. Can you do something which can sense nicotine instead? Um, by then we also progressed to not just have a patch which has wires hanging off it. We were actually able to make a wireless communication module which kind of goes along with the patch. So this is a patch which actually communicates either through NFC technology, which is near field communication technology or through Bluetooth technology. So this was something which we just published early last year or no, late last year. We were also able to make what was called electronic skin. And that was fabulous because right from the beginning in the media, this was pitted as electronic skin. Somehow that's the word which stuck. So to truly actually make electronic skin and what I mean by electronic skin is a layer which replicates the properties of our skin was phenomenal. And this was really nice to see that last year, actually the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine went to these two people over there for actually discovery of receptors for temperature and touch. So there's some of that learning, which allowed us to actually feed back and understand how does our skin actually sense? So how does our skin sense pressure? How does our skin sense temperature? How does it communicate to the brain? And we don't react to all the temperature changes the same way every single time. Our brain is obviously smart. And how do you actually, can we create a electronic equivalent of the same thing? So what you see over there again, little too much to go into was where we actually created receptors which behave similar to the receptors in our skin and nerve, they, almost, they also communicate with what's like an artificial brain and the artificial brain is identifying the thresholds and communicating back to those receptors for a particular response. A lot to take in, in in 30 seconds, but I'm happy to, you know, answer questions on that as well. So that was something which is phenomenal to see because in some ways it's like the prototype electronic skin. So imagine a world, you can put this on prosthetics and just extend the capabilities of prosthetics, go from just being prosthetics to being really human hand lifelike with the skin added on top of it. So really fundamental research, but that was enabled again by those early discoveries. And then in some ways there was kind of Eureka moment again. So after three years of talking to numerous, numerous, numerous industry partners, I met Cam through an industry liaison person who worked in the Austrian Academy of Science. And by then, I still took every meeting. I still answered every email. And I had Cam come up and speak to me about a project which didn't involve tiny sensors, which didn't involve the micro nano research facility or the clean rooms in RMIT. We weren't talking wearables anymore. But what he wanted me to do was literally put sensors on a mattress. I'm flexible like my technology, which is what I learned after three years of those conversations. And I said, you know what, if that's what the industry needs, then let's just go down that pathway. So Cam, Sleep Tight and Sleep Easy are always special to me because they were the first ever industry collaboration we had. And uh, it's phenomenal to see the journey which we had after that. More on this, I'll cover up after this, but just as an introduction to what this piece is, they're essentially sensors which sit across the entire surface of a mattress. So what he is trying to do is put them in residential aged care homes, and that enables the non-invasive monitoring of residents in the facility overnight. What this can do for you is measure the presence the position and the posture of the person in bed overnight. And that just opens up a lot, whole lot of possibilities and makes caring for them a lot more easier. It's like a, a luck, luck just hit us after that. And after that, we managed to then talk to a lot more industry partners. Australia truly entered into the startup world. So now we collaborate with quite a few different industry partners on other aspects of commercializing our technology. So you see some of them over here. So be it 
patches which you can stick on your skin to monitor interstitial fluid to understand either drugs in your interstitial fluid or glucose levels in your interstitial fluid. That's one of the industry partners and industry projects we work on. What you see over there is actually an ECG patch. So a wearable which you can stick on your skin, which is measuring your ECG. It's wireless. So again, the, uh, the aim for that is to again for aged care health and intervention. So if you can have a patch like this, which is monitoring your ECG and all the carer has to do is bring a phone close to that and get the ECG data off their sensor onto them and they know then exactly when to intervene. So it monitors infection, it monitors the ECG, it can be built in to monitor other sensors as well. That's a patch for monitoring dry eye disease management. So it's not just monitoring, it's actually dry eye disease management. So it's capable of applying temperature as well as we're working on applying force as well to alleviate the dry eye disease. Most of us have dry eyes, but some of them have it really bad to the point of where they have to go into the optometrist and have like a sandwich press on their eyes just to alleviate them of their symptoms. So we're trying to see if we can make patches to just get rid of those worst symptoms they go through. And we also make UV detection patches, either color changing patches or sensors, which actually just actually monitor how much UV you've had on a day-to-day -day basis. Back to Remy and back to our sleep tight journey. So when CAM came to us, I think back in 2018 it was, and we were incredibly lucky. We managed to get a CRCP grant, which allowed us to then keep collaborating and working well with each other. These were the initial considerations which we had to go through. So what was this and what was nicely made in a micro nano research facility, wearing a clean room gown, contamination control and everything, nope, not possible anymore. We can't make mattress size sensors in a clean room facility or you know, at this scale, it's not required either. It doesn't have to be micro or nano anymore. We're talking macro sensors. So this is gold, by the way, a lot of uh, electronics we use, prototype electronics uses gold or platinum thin films because they are just the noble metals. They don't oxidize and they are the best conductors you can have can't really have gold on a mattress sensor. So material considerations are again, are things which you had to go through as well. It was a collaboration across multiple sectors. So it was not just CAM we were working with and sleep tight. We also had a manufacturing partner, Sleep Easy on that journey. And I, to me, that was a game changer. Having those conversations with the manufacturing partner right from the beginning, we didn't go about it the usual way. We didn't try and make a prototype in a lab and then sit there wondering now, how can we scale this up? We literally approached it the other way. We thought if we can make a prototype in a manufacturing facility by overcoming all those challenges, then to go from hundreds to thousands to 10,000s is pretty much straightforward. And so it took a long time to get that first prototype. A lot of, will this ever work kind of question marks on our face every day, but then when it worked, we knew we had kind of hit the jackpot. So materials, their cost, the reliability, all that had to be you know, reconsidered in many ways. We literally had to redo everything which we ever planned. So this is not a scaling up exercise. It was literally replanning and redoing the whole thing. Of course, we had to, had to have reliable data. So the sensors have to be sensitive. They also have to be reusable. So we can't have one-off mattress protectors, which you just toss off and then go, okay, let's put a new cover now and let's start again. It's a lot about reusability. The cost point, as Cam will tell you in his presentation, is really, really sensitive. But then you think about aged care and you realize... We are not the only ones aging, everyone's aging all around the world. So why is this a unique issue to Australia or why is it we can't have borrowed lessons from elsewhere in the world? It's a cultural story. We don't age the same way all around the world. Like for instance, when I go back to India, I can't even have a conversation with my mother about asking her to take my grandmother to a residential aged care homes. That's considered equivalent to abandoning them. Just not possible. Whereas when I went to Singapore and I said, I'm doing all these things, they said, why are you approaching this in such a complicated manner? Just put a camera in the room and that will tell you everything about the person in the, in the bed. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I can't go down that path either. So it's, it's funny because there's so many cultural variations in the way we approach aging. So, you know, what's applied in one country is not necessarily can be uptaken up in another country. Uh, there were gender differences in the way people were actually on the bed. So this was some of the modeling which we did. It's some of my diversity piece, which I kind of brought in back into it. Women and men sleep very differently. The weight distribution on the bed is different. And so the mattress sensors possibly need to make sure we account for those differences as well when we actually design that product. Um, user interactions were key. And again, that I learned a lot from CAM and CAM's experiences talking to the nurses in the aged care homes how we needed to make sure that this is a product which will be readily uptaken by them and doesn't add to their workload. Instead, it actually makes it easier for them and enhances the quality of care. Cam's probably been to a lot of uh, technical conferences and I have been to my fair share of aged care conferences. So we've done both and learned a lot, I think. 
So we managed to go from that to creating a, 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 long, a big macro scale sensor, which could actually then be embedded onto a fabric. Again, there was a lot of consideration, consideration in terms of where to place these sensors and what we eventually ended up doing was this. So from this to this, literally. So we're talking a mattress protector and we have the sensors embedded at the back of that. And then you have the electronics, which is kind of talking to the monitor and giving you the information about the person in bed or not in bed. Sleep easy again, uh, having those conversations and having them on the journey. So trying to make these at scale, large area, covering an entire thing, single mattress, that was something which we could do having them along on the journey. And then came the testing. Uh, this is the Rollator machine. So this, these are actually machines which are used to test mattresses. So used to test the lifetime of mattresses. So every mattress you buy, if it says it has a 10 year warranty, that means it's lasted 50,000 cycles on this Rollator machine because 10,000 cycles on this Rollator machine is equivalent to two years. So we wanted to actually test our Remy sensors and see if they last the same kind of time frame on this. How, how much age, how, how much do they age with time and how long can they actually be used for? So you literally used to put this and back the rollator to and fro and actually understand how the sensor is actually behaving under so much pressure. So that was a very interesting way of testing the sensors. Scary when you know you're always handling these things in a very delicate manner with tweezers and gloves. And then you go into, you know, just putting the sensors, throw, throw a rollator on top of it and see what happens. We launched Remy in March last year. And uh, since then, we have again been on a journey to think about, okay, what's next? We deliver on the goals for the CRCP. Uh, we have a product, a prototype now, which is at the tech technology readiness levels of around six to seven. But then where do we go from here? That's, that's what we, we are definitely working towards in terms of making sure that we can embed Remy in various rooms in the residential aged care home and then have the person, a carer who's looking after them, have a dashboard in front of them with a very clear vision of knowing when to go and when to intervene and when to offer that quality of care. Um, there are a lot of other things we can do with Remy. I think Cam might recover them in the presentation. This is not just about residential aged care homes. As we went on this journey, we realized there's so many more applications. And again, it's not just about mattress sensors. Being able to do this in terms of actually have electronics embedded on a fabric, that opens up a whole lot of possibilities as well in terms of clothes or wherever else, you know, fabric is used and you want electronics embedded in them. That's a phenomenal team who have contributed to all the research I presented to, about today. So that's a fantastic team, which I'm really lucky to co-lead. Uh, a diverse team in engineering, which is a bit rare to see, but uh, we really, really value all their contributions. And it's been phenomenal to see them push through the last two years of the pandemic as well. And of course, where would we without all the funding which we managed to you know, get from all these people who have supported us right from the beginning, be it the fundamental science or be it the applied science or be it these kind of commercialization journeys. I'll stop at that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madhu. That's terrific. Um, are there any questions in the room? And can I just say for those who are online, if you uh, would like to put questions into the Q&A uh, section of Zoom, uh, we will endeavour to uh, pass those on to the speakers here tonight. So are there any questions for Madhu um, from the room or from the q and I'll just sit down and watch the Q&A. Um, well, Madhu, I, I take your remarks. Congratulations on your work. But I was very intrigued by the picture of your, your, EC, your ECG patch. So is that a prototype you made in the factory? No. I was wondering where it's up to. That's actually being handmade in RMIT right now. It's painstaking. So to actually to do the, take those surface mount devices and actually make them by hand, uh, it takes a lot of time and patience, which is what some of our postdocs and research assistants are doing. But yes, the hope is very much that once we have those initial prototype devices, now, some of those are actually going to be tested by the NHS in the UK. They're actually going to undergo field trial in the UK in aged care homes. And then once we know it's, it's ready and it's done, we'll, we hope to be able to you know, prototype it elsewhere, not by hand anymore, no. All right, so it's, it's real though. Okay. So can I ask a question? I mean, you have so many possible areas for applications. I would have thought of flexible sensors. How do you decide, I mean, apart from the current work with Cameron, but how do you decide, you know, what, what, what area you should really go into? What's what industry? Um, I mean, you just, to me, you must have so many uh, opportunities. So Mark, your question was, how do you decide which opportunities to take up with the flexible sensors? Um, I don't want to make that decision. And hence my, you know, my numerous conversations with industry partners, because I think I realized 
where I think is important is obvious, clearly not. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the market. I don't know what's necessary, what's not necessary. Um, and that is why I was kind of almost led by the industry partner. So everything which I spoke about over there was literally things which came out of conversations I had with industry partners. It was not me making decisions of where to go. I think fundamentally science wise, I know where to go, but as far as applications are concerned, I'm, I just take those conversations and then go down that path. Okay. But I'm sure what your mind is working on. Working After three years, I don't trust my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought UV sensors is the next big thing, but clearly it's not because I thought we live in a land of skin cancer and I thought people would love to have UV sensors, but not really. I, I, it's just gone down so many different other paths, which I didn't anticipate. The healthcare, I, I clearly get that. People are, especially after a pandemic, people are even more anxious to know about their health. Early intervention, as well as prevention of, you know, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, if you can prevent them, why go through with, you know, medica medication or anything of that sort. So that is definitely an area which I can see a lot of promise and potential in. But beyond that, I let the industry partners decide. Had a great presentation. Um, really proud of the group and the team. Um, you mentioned, and, and you and your team do this remarkably well, the Scrum Academic Research Team, is your market your work. And you mentioned media releases, and that being part of the game change, I think, in terms of attracting attention. But there's a lot of information out there. How did you actually, what, what approach did you use cut through all the other information that's out there about new technology so you could reach out to the industry and make them aware of what you're doing. Did you, you know, the normal things would be LinkedIn, a website, yep. blah, blah, blah. Was there anything you think that stood out in the way that you were trying to promote your technical capability to industry that they go, wow, I can see an application for this? Sure. So as far as media releases are concerned, I've been doing that for nearly 11 years now. So this wasn't the first work I promoted through the media. My very first research was back in 2011 at Piezoelectrics, and that's something I put out in the media. Um, I work with the RMIT Media and Comms team, and they do a phenomenal job. I remember the first time I worked with them, they had to talk to me for two hours to cut the jargon out. So I had this conversation, I'm like, but it does this. And she was like, no, but just tell me in layman terms what it actually really does and what it actually really means. So it was a trial by fire in some sense. I was put on live TV, I was put on radio. Half the time I was just, I was wondering what am I talking about, but I learned how to speak, I guess, after that. But one thing which has definitely come out is not a single industry partner has ever come to me and said, I read that journal article of yours and geez, wasn't that fantastic. It was almost always, <laughs> I heard you on radio, or I saw you on television, or I saw some article of you written up on some science, uh, you know, online news outlet and kind of sparked my mind. And we kind of leave it over there deliberately that we can, this is just our prototype and this is just a demonstration, but we're willing to, you know, have the conversation with you and take it down those versatile various paths. Uh, but beyond that, seriously, it's just how people responded to that and went from there. Uh, yeah, maybe a more skeptical question, maybe. But uh, so, for example, like smartwatches are like really, it's, it's, it's all silicon based, they have like lots of sensors in that, like a very small area. And it, I assume, you may or not, uh, that with these flexible electronics, you won't be able to really downscale as far as you would be with uh, silicon electronics. So, um, where like, I, I, I kind of, Assume now that people are prepared to wear like this really stiff watch to do e ECG, like hello, my smart smartwatch does ECG, but it doesn't. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it it tells me I have all kinds of diseases all the time, so uh, it, it works great. Uh, but yeah, how how do you see the competition for wearables um, between silicon-based devices and these flexible associates and when do you think like maybe your technology would take over in the, in the future or like where where is it in competition because silicon has like billions of something every year i'm i'm never competing with silicon in, in terms of the speed or in terms of you know the miniaturization aspects of it what a lot of people are trying to do are what's called hard soft integration so where you're taking your tiny silicon chips but almost embedding it in this kind of a polymer just to give you a little bit of a best of both worlds if you can in some sense which is a little bit of what we do with the ECG sensor. So it's like more of a plastic 
uh, base, but then we're actually having uh, you know components on top of it, which are still based on silicon. So it kind of brings it a little closer to it being more on a polymeric platform rather than a silicon based platform. It requires probably a similar billions and billions of dollars worth of investment before we go down that path. Do we really need to go down that path for everything? And that's something I guess, which I've learned from all my industry conversations. You don't need to, right? I mean, there are numerous applications. Some of them need this, some of them don't. Let's just pick and choose what really needs to be flexible and wearable and others which probably don't need to be. Yeah, that's, that's why I thought uh, this is so interesting. It's, uh, it's a very good uh, choice of uh, application. Thank you so much. I'm afraid uh, in light of time, I need to just finish this particular uh, part of the meeting. But uh, would you please welcome, uh, sorry, would you please thank um, Madhu for that fantastic presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Cameron uh, Van den Dongen. Uh, he's the CEO of Sleep Tight. Uh, you've heard a bit about Sleep Tight from Madhu. And he's a non executive director of the company 40 Winks. For more than a decade, Cameron has traveled the world searching for innovation and technology in the area of sleep science and research. The basis for the search was to determine what was next in the uh, sleep industry and how the bedroom would evolve as part of the connected house. Cameron uncovered gaps <clears throat> excuse me, in the quality of the data collected by existing sensors, as well as a lack of research and understanding around how to measure a good night's sleep. This led him to, to create the company Sleep Tight, a health tech company designed to innovate in the space of both health and sleep. I was surprised to understand how many problems have sleep issues in the world. I mean, it's a huge issue. So it'll be terrific to hear from Cameron. Would you please welcome Cameron Van der Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I really appreciate it. Hold on, I'm gonna make sure I get across to there. I have no idea where this presentation is going to go today because as Mardu will tell you, I will follow my nose on pretty much everything that goes on. And I asked Mardu yesterday, what do brilliant minds in engineering want to hear from me for when you've got someone like Mardu? By the way, the Batter of Metal Night, I was actually her uh, invitation. I was her plus one that night because her husband couldn't make it. So that was a very, very proud night for us. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll tell you a bit of a journey about... Um, how sleep type was formed a bit more in depth and, and thank you Mark for mentioning before that uh, the bio or the blurb that goes into it but there's there's a lot more um, that has really driven me down this path and and I think Madhu said people want to know what is it that led you to actually roll the dice on commercializing technology and what is it that have been the challenges the pitfalls the hurdles what's kept me up at night what's been rewarding so I'm going to sort of follow my nose and and, and take Madhu's lead as to, uh, as to how this unfolds, this presentation. So I'm not just gonna go through the mill on it. And it started really with an idea. So while Madhu was sitting there in a lab working with her incredibly um, gifted team of engineers and scientists at RMIT, I was rolling back into my father's business, which is 40 Winks. He started that with a group of uh, people back in the, the early to mid eighties. And um, the global financial crisis had hit. I'd been in advertising. And being a good uh, little European boy, when mum calls and said, your dad needs help, you drop everything and go and help. And I sat there in his world. So it would have been 2009. And I looked at this industry and went, here we are touting Visco foams as though they're revolutionary new technologies. And yet they were created as part of the space program um, you know, by NASA and, and other scientists so, you know, from the 1960s. So that's not really new technology. Pocket Springs was another one, which were invented in the 1900s. That's not really new technology. The connected home was a huge, big thing. And I sat there and went, there's gotta be something else. Like these are just white boxes. They're a, a gateway to a better life, surely, aren't they? So I went on, a, I went on a, a journey and it was traveling the world. Luckily I was, um, I was in a position to do so. And I dug through the trades halls of the world, the research labs of the world and realized no one was working on what was next. Well, not meaningfully anyway. Um, and so I started to formulate these ideas in meeting brilliant people, whether it was biometric data analytics companies out of um, Canada, whether it was uh, data extraction companies uh, playing with some form of sensor out of Spain. There was all sorts of people I was meeting and I started to come up with an idea. Mardu was doing the same thing in her world. Um, I'm going to cut to this because I know that we'll get to the meat of what it was. It doesn't really matter why I created it. It's probably more um, what happened after this team got together. This was at RMIT and I find myself exceptionally lucky 
that I met, I'm going to stay on this slide for a bit because um, this project's nothing without the people. Forget the logos of the universities, forget the companies behind me and whatever else. It was actually the people that made this project. Um, if I hadn't met Mardu, I don't know where this project would be. I'd probably still be working out who's doing what somewhere. And I was very fortunate to meet Mardu first. And, and she mentioned um, a gentleman who's an industry advisor called Rob Fildes. And I want to call out him because it, it, there's these moments in life when people invite you to a meeting. And Mardu and I share one thing in common. We take every meeting. A lot of people say your time should be chosen. You should be very, you know, purposeful with your time and pick and choose carefully. I like to explore and learn and listen and hear stories. And I think Mardu has got a similar inquisitive mind and like to see people's reasoning and rationale and, and just learn. Um, I took a meeting and I went to a lunch because Rob Fieldies had seen a presentation from an associate professor called Mardu Baskarin. And he knew what project I was working on. And he was the one that put the two and two together. And I probably haven't told this story much publicly because I kind of brush over it to start to talk about the technology. But the sparking moment when I sat down and Madhu told me first and she pulled out the little device and I looked at that and I went, this is great. Can we take that instead of looking at environmental factors, can we put it on a bed and look at biometrics? And Madhu went, yeah, we can. And start, that was literally where it started. Then I met Sharaf, her husband, who's another brilliant mind out of RMIT University. And we sat down on the back of an envelope and I said, well, what's this going to cost? Because at the end of the day, I don't have private equity behind it. Sleep tight still doesn't. There's no venture capital. It's bootstrapped. And we've been able to keep it that way for four years. And I'll get into detail as to why that's been important for me and been a real priority for me. But the person who's probably the unsung hero here is this gentleman right there, Bill Mansus. So Bill is the one that's sort of standing on the outside. And Bill has been probably one of the quietest members of our project. Never goes in front of the media never does any real publicity. He turns up begrudgingly when I force him out. Bill's the managing director of a, of a manufacturing business in Campbellfield in Victoria, in Melbourne. And I needed to break away a manufacturer from the herd because what we are working on will disrupt mattress manufacturing in a big way. It breaks their model. Now, I needed one of them to come with me. I approached others around the world. No one wanted to go down this path. Bill rolled the dice and came with us. So without Mardu, without Rob Fieldies in the first place, and by the way, Rob is now our um, chair of our advisory board. So he's still got continuity there. Without the Australian Academy of Science introducing and, and bringing together Rob as part of an industry advisory thing, none of this would, would exist. It's a, it was a chance opportune moment. And without Bill deciding to try and break the model of his own business, this wouldn't exist either. Why aged care? Well, I, I don't think I really need to go into too much detail. Hopefully people have seen the results of the Royal Commission. It is, and I'm going to use the term, I've been saying it strongly, it's disgusting the way we treat our elderly. Not just here, everywhere in the world. And if I go to Hong Kong and I was flown over by the Hong Kong Council of Social Services to speak at a conference, a Geron Tech uh, conference in 2019, they've got the exact same problem in Hong Kong that we do here. Some of my phone calls from India, I've, I've had incredible interest out of India because of the same challenges arriving, arising everywhere. Um, I've seen it coming for a long time, a bit of a very quick bit of background. I won't go into detail about it, but when my parents, or sorry, my grandparents first came to Australia, they opened private aged care homes in Turak and South Yarra um, in a group home environment. And um, it's interesting that I've had a touch point all the way along and I saw my Omar go from running them to living in them. And I saw what she went through. And when she was fine and independent, she was happy. The moment she wasn't, she was done. She pulled the pin. And this is unfortunately what we're seeing now. People do not want to go into aged care. The data's there and you can read it for yourself. But the tsunami is not only coming, it's here right now. And unfortunately, this pandemic showed all the glaring drama and challenges we've got globally in looking after our elderly. So, Remy, the idea of this is to make the consumer, which is a terminology in the aged care sector for an aged care resident, which is older form um, uh, terminology, make them feel like they're not a guinea pig, not being poked and prodded, give them some dignity and respect back into their life. What's happening right now, um, outside of a couple of little radar sensors in the higher end facilities, we still see a door check in rooms. Is she in bed or not? Is he in bed or not? And often wake them up to check they're okay. What we're doing is counterproductive to looking after them by waking them up, by disrupting them, by putting the lights on. And it's not just in aged care. We do the same thing in hospitals. 
We do the same thing in trauma recovery units, in out, outpatient hospitals. We are not really doing the right job when the number one element of recovery is rest. The number one thing you need to do after major surgery, after major trauma is sleep and let your body repair and heal. So the idea for Remy was how do we allow you to sleep but still look after you without having to attach things to you? Hence, we went down the path of, and hopefully this plays if I press this next button, because this will just give you a bit of an idea of where the technology can start to go. Fall prevention is a critical element for us, but just as much as fall prevention is the fact that we're struggling to get enough workers into the sector. And with people moving into aged care, quality of care and being able to prioritize the time of the workforce is critically important. Giving them tools for them to be able to do their job when they're already overworked, they're already underpaid, they're already smashed every single day at work. How do we give them more tools to do the job they love? People don't go into caring because they wanna make money. They go into caring because they wanna look after people. So let's help them do what they do. And that is essentially what the industry has been asking for. Don't add to their workflow. Give them tools to help them do their jobs more efficiently and actually allow them to spend more time just doing what they wanna do, which is care for people. We were lucky enough to get the CRCP and I'm not gonna go into detail there, but this program again, doesn't live without that funding. Um, it allowed me to keep purity of project. I didn't even know what a CRCP was until about 12 months after I got one. So that's a true story. I'll tell you about that another time. Um, I speak to the industry. I'll be going to the Cooperative Research Australia conference to talk about why does industry not know about cooperative research and how to get money, but that's another conversation. Mardu's done a pretty good job of giving you a bit of an insight into what goes into the technology. But this piece, as much as it sounds like it's been a, um, you know, a wonderful success story, the drama of getting this to work, the frustration we have felt. Madhu and I were even joking. There have been times where we've gone through basically a year and have we even moved forward? Then we've jumped forward about five years in a two month period. But it's been a, um, a really interesting um, dynamic in our team. I'm so lucky that I've got researchers as partners that have a flexibility of approach. So if I say to them, we need to do all of this and it can't cost the consumer any more than 200 bucks and we've got to make our margin in that cost price. All of a sudden that sets some parameters on them. There's plenty of researchers that say, sorry, can't do it, not interested, not what we're going to do. Madhu, Samit, Sharath all said, absolutely, we'll have a, we'll have a go. Okay, it needs to be smashed by a rollator, hitting it at 120 kilograms of force rolling backwards and forwards over it, 10,000 cycles. Okay, we'll have a go at that. Let's see what happens. I've got a background in motorsport as well, and I often look at it, and I've said to my team at times, we're taking too long perfecting this. Let's just put it on the rollator. Let's see what happens. And I remember Dashen, he, was a, he worked tirelessly on this project, Dashen Dong, who was a, a wonderful team member of Mardu's. He freaked out that we were going to put it on a rollator. And I went, I'd rather work it out now that this thing doesn't survive than spend another two years of research to find out it doesn't work. So against his wishes, we put it on the rollator in December 2020. And surprisingly, he goes, it's lasted. I went, happy days. Keep moving forward. Let's find some more money. Let's keep moving. But it's, it's one of those ones where we're able to have challenging conversations. We're able to throw down the gauntlet at times to each other. And there's a mutual respect amongst us that means... No one takes it. There's a respect for the research and there's a respect for our world as well. The power of Remy is more than just aged care. The power of Remy is that we have got opportunities now already popping up. In fact, one of the first phone calls I got after we launched in 2018 was from Corrections, a prison in Queensland. How do we monitor and look after people that are remanded? wow, there's an opportunity there. I hadn't even thought about it. It's got a whole lot of new challenges, but in essence, they want to make sure that under their quality of care, they are looking after people. Boarding schools. Again, groups of people, high risk area, low look after at the middle of the night. How do we monitor them without cameras and microphones? Defence. How do we monitor the quality of uh, sleep? And I'll give you a, a very real example. Um, and this is when crossover happened with sleep researchers. The subs. They can now go underwater for more than 120 days before resurfacing. I think it's actually 160 days, but we'll say 120 because they'll probably kill me if I get it wrong. It's actually quite light in there. There's lights everywhere. It's noisy, hot. The quality of sleep's not great. And they'll often, uh, a commanding officer will often ro roster someone on for an 11 hour hot zone. How do they determine who they roster on and who they don't? 
the science at the moment is, I know you, Mark, you're a good operator. You seem to do well under pressure. You're on. How about we're able to monitor the quality or duration of sleep and go, here's the report of the best rested. So you can actually prioritize people and have some better decision making because we know through a better night's sleep, you, you're better with your response time, your alertness, your decision making. I mean, that's already, that's already proven from, a, well, I shouldn't say settled because it's still, it's emerging, but it's pretty clear the better you sleep, the better, the better you respond. So there's a lot of opportunity in and around the space of sleep, but we needed to pick one and focus. And that was aged care for me was one, I knew there was an immediate need. I knew there was a market willing to adopt if we got the price right and we got it very clear on what we could deliver. Um, but I wanted to mention just how much of, a, um, of an opportunity and a gateway this is. Now, the last thing I, I wanted to go into detail, and you asked a question before about RMIT and their um, press releases and media and how critical it is. For my world, it is critical, absolutely critical we get media writing about us. Because if we don't get media writing about us, then we're not interesting to the government. Government, you know, departments don't choose who they fund or don't fund. Venture capital or private equity don't get behind you or don't get behind you. Movements and causes, I mean, you can have a wonderful technology, but if no one cares, it sits there and gets gathers dust. So half of my job is actually out there promoting, sp promoting spruiking. I feel like a ringmaster at times where I'm just trying to drum up hype around the project. But one of the benefits is the team at RMIT know that this is part of my role and they have trudged to so many presentations with me, but they are there, they are passionate, they are right alongside me as a true partner. And it's actually a big shout out to the RMIT um, comms team. Not every uni university has a team like that. I've worked with other universities and I'll never name and shame them who don't understand the power of good communications and coordinating communications. And one thing, and I'm not saying it just because I'm in a partnership and I'm now, I've got my lab based in RMIT, it's far beyond that. There is a genuine partnership, not just with the research team, but the universities embraced us. So I've, um, and I know you're a dean and you're quite happy about being at RMIT as well, um, but I'm very proud of that relationship. And if they, they've backed me in as well and they've backed my team in, um, to have that sort of support has meant that those moments when I've rolled the dice and think I might've lost it all here, which happens and I've had those moments. When you've got that support and you can pick up a phone and show vulnerability to your research team and to the university partners, that is worth its weight in gold. And that's why I'll always speak glowingly of RMIT University because they've been that sort of support and at times have carried me through some dark days. Um, and that's things I think people don't talk about as much. It's, it's actually a team effort. And as long as everybody's willing to give a bit, in the end, we all get a lot, hopefully. So there you go. Thank you. I just ask one about markets. Yeah. Um, international markets. I know you've been working on the Australian market. Yeah. Uh, market? Would you would you manufacture for overseas or would you license or? or yeah. The, the biggest problem we're going to have. So demand is not an issue. I'll be honest with you. We've got from ResMed calling us wanting to talk about all their businesses in North America. Um, Hong Kong uh, desperate for it. Um, South Korea through Kotra writing up articles about us. Um, Europe, I've got people wanting to, everywhere, I've got distributors out of my ears at the moment. My problem is going to be able to manufacture at scale. Um, cause I, I, I'm, we're 12 months away from having this at a TRL eight, nine, that we've got an AMGC grant, which we'd be very lucky. And I, someone in this room had a bit to do with helping us with that. Um, we've been very lucky that we've continued that support and the AMGC commercialization grant has me. 99.9% .9 confident that that TRL nine will be achieved or eight, nine will be achieved within the next 12 months. I'm on a runway right now on picking the market that we distribute to first, because as you can see, we've had to develop a manufacturing process. So it wasn't, I can't go to a contract manufacturer in China and go, here's our beautiful recipe. Can you make it for us? We ended up creating a manufacturing process and patenting that. So my challenge is supply in terms of markets. It's actually a lot bigger. It's actually quite daunting. I actually got asked the other day by some investors, what's your mainland China strategy? And I said, I don't have one because I'm scared of that market. Um, supply is going to be our big challenge and manufacturing it fast enough. That's a great business to be in. It is. It's still daunting because to grow and to build manufacturing facilities, because we're doing that with our partners, is very expensive. And so, um, you know, the, we, we were going to go for a modern manufacturing initiative and we aborted just purely because we, we felt we're 12 months early on going for that. And also we're not settled that we could manufacture at the right price in Australia. 
and ship boxes out of Australia. So look, the Victorian government's been really good with us lately and Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions have visited a couple of times and they're pretty keen to help us keep manufacturing here. And we'll do that if we can, because I'm, I'm, I'm a Melbourne boy. Like I don't want to leave Melbourne. I don't want to see this project leave Melbourne. RMIT, Melbourne Uni, Sleep Easy, Melbourne Manufacturer, me, Melbourne. So, uh, but the reality is we haven't settled where we're going to make it yet. We're going to go where the market, you know, the best, it's easier to ship boxes out of Shanghai than it is out of Sydney. Oh, I was just, um, with the technology, I, I noticed that you're trying to predict, uh, sorry, trying to monitor a number of different things like yeah. body temperature, pressure. Was there anything that you wanted to measure that you couldn't? There's a lot of things that we potentially can measure and we can't talk about yet because of <laughs> class 2A requirements on uh, on what we could do because we're playing What's in class 2A. Uh, so for a medical device which is if we so I'll give you a perfect example that's happened recently we can we can very clearly at the moment detect pressure over time so if someone hasn't moved for x amount of time we could theoretically say that we've got a pressure wound concern here mm -hmm. we've got to be very careful unless we've gone and got 2A classification which is hundreds of thousands of dollars which I technically don't need for a home care product um, it's on our developmental pathway and we could do it in version one, but we're having to sort of work out the right language to say pressure over time is an indicative for care response, but we can't say that we're a pressure wounds prevention device. Mm -hmm. So um, Madhu could probably tell you a lot more about where we're, we're at, but we, I mean, we're getting respiratory rates on stomach, on stomach and, and back sleepers, mm -hmm. um, but we, can, we don't want to talk about those yet because again, that starts to open up TGA challenges, FDA challenges and others. Um, and we're so sensitive, we can actually, we, we're pretty confident we can pick up heart rate through that same signal. Uh, again, we, we collect it, but we can't switch it on just yet. Um, there's a lot more to play with. Like, we, we're learning that even posture is critically important. Just knowing, you know, more people are found dead in the prone position. So if they're in prone position for X amount of time, huge concern. These are the things we're playing with right now, but it's actually the decision making that we ignore that's the most important part, the most critical element at the moment. Because if I go too big too early, the thing just doesn't go anywhere. So presence is the number one element they want to know. Are they in bed or not? And if they're out of bed, how long have they been out of bed for? And how do we trigger an alert? Because presumably this has got fantastic application for mattresses for babies, for seats. So, um, it wouldn't be a shock to know all of our testing was done on cot mattresses but you know in reality there's been more interest out of aged care than there has been out of neonatal care or or since so we pick our markets based on those because i was actually going to ask about testing human testing did you have volunteers i've got my two boys are sleeping on it right now <laughs> and, and then how do you get the feedback because presumably you'd have um from your uh, monitoring um and then perhaps improvements did you want to jump up, Mardu, and talk a little bit about Sunder has been doing some of the testing at the moment. So the, the researcher that we've now had move across, he's, he's been sleeping on it since October. We've got an aged care partner, which we haven't made the announcement on, so I've got to be careful what I say. We've rolled out, we've taken some test units into an aged care facility and started to work that way. Um, I've also had my two boys sleeping on it. So in their king single beds in our house. Um, it's more durability at the moment. So, and making sure the signal um is reliable stable and that the decision making we make from that we're comfortable it is accurate um that's the bit i don't want to rush and that's been the challenge because you're on a surface that moves so much and you can't replicate the same position every time because it's on foam as opposed to a hard table surface it's it's learning those characteristics in fact we've probably found that the rollade has been harder on it than anybody ever would be which is not a bad thing from a motorsport background point of view you know, you want to push it right to its limit. And then if it survives that, well, it's just, it's going to operate at nine tenths every day. So in terms of the feedback loop, no one feels it. The comfort is, is they don't even know it's there. Um, it's more just making sure we've got stability. And we, we're doing some redesigning of the, the PCB at the moment, just on a couple of bits and pieces, but the actual cover itself is responding beautifully. Is that fair enough? Yeah, <laughs> have to check with my boss. <laughs> And I never said rock star, my dude. Oh. I always call her a rock star, but I told I wasn't going to call you a rock star today. But you have. I have. <laughs> I got around to it. I was a loophole. Well, 
Well, look, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, let's drop the glass. Oh. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've been very privileged to have heard from a successful researcher and a successful commercializer of the same technology. We don't often hear that story together tonight and the journey they've been on. So, uh, look, just for the last time, perhaps, could you please thank Madhu and Cameron? And I'll now just ask our chair, Bronwyn, to uh, wrap up the meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhu and Cameron. We do have a, a bottle of wine for each of you, which might might decide to give to you. Right now. If you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's really amazing to hear your story of the power of such um, a deep and impactful partnership. And we can't wait to hear how your technology goes as, and where it develops and where it evolves to in the future. So thank you so much for sharing that with us this evening. Um, so I'd just like to remind you again about the commencement dinner on the 16th of March, where Professor Brett Sutton, our Chief Health Officer, will be our guest speaker. It'd be wonderful to see everyone in person. And then a date for your diary on the 7th of April, we have a special presentation that's focused on hydrogen, which is such an interesting and rapidly evolving topic. It'll be a really fantastic presentation. And finally, tomorrow is a very special day it's not only my birthday, well, thank you in advance for all of your messages. It is UNESCO World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development, the first um, World Engineering Day. So please make sure that you tweet, um, share on LinkedIn and let's celebrate engineering tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you all in person at the commencement dinner. Thank you.